What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another live stream from the Scalar Learning Channel. And it is that time. It is that day, the day before the March SAT. So this is always a big day. We've got a lot of people signed up for the March SAT, both internationally and domestically. And this live stream is going to be applicable to both tests, the new digital version and the old version because the current version, I should say, domestically, because conceptually, it's pretty much similar. So there are a couple interesting things that I've noticed that I've gone through this week, to, uh, doing a bunch of digital SATs, like small, small nuances, but overall, conceptually, it's all consistent. So that's what we're going to focus on today is the most important formulas, as well as my 41 strategy series um, that has uh, been really, really helpful for a lot of students. So real quick, I'm just going to blast out on the Discord server to let everybody know that we are live and ready to go and get as many folks on here as possible that are motivated, hungry, ready to do this, ready to perform at their absolute best and their absolute optimal. And uh, we're going to get this going right now. Let me blast it out. And by the way, if you haven't joined our Discord server, you should definitely join it. It's free. The link is in the uh, description below. And <clears throat> it's just an amazing community of students. It's really more run by the students than me at this point. It's just amazing, motivated students from all over the world. A lot of people are forming study groups, bouncing ideas off of, of each other, giving each other moral support. And really, I didn't know much about Discord. One of my students is the one that told me about it and said, you got to start a Discord server. And now we've almost got 3,000 members. And yeah, it's just super, super cool. So uh, a, a cool little supportive ecosystem there. <clears throat> okay, my throat is still just a touch scratchy. So I'm going to be drinking water throughout the presentation. Try to keep my voice going as strong as possible. This will be a long one. All right, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let's get it. Let's get into it. Um, what's up, Arshil? Just want to say what's up to some of the people here. <clears throat> I see you're afraid. We got you covered. We're going to go through everything today. Tunar, uh, for the digital SAT, honestly, I don't even think there's much material out there now. I do know. I just got a, a, a message from my good buddy at Test Innovators that they've just come out with their digital SAT resource. So you could check that out. As To my knowledge, other than the SAT Blue Book that has been released by the College Board, that's the only other resource I think that's available right now for the online digital version. So they're ahead of the curve. You definitely want to check those guys out. And the CEO or um, you know the founder of the company, he's a good friend of mine. He's an awesome guy. So that could be, that could be something. Now, I, just as a quick caveat, I haven't checked it out yet. I've got a meeting with them next week. And I want to check out everything that they've built and created. So I haven't seen it yet, but I know, uh, the, like I said, the founder, he's tip top. He's awesome. So it's probably quite good. Um, let's see what else out of their comments. People from Pakistan. My family's from India. So that's so cool. All right. Here we go. Let's do this. <clears throat> All right. Formula number one, this one, you got to know. It is, oh, hold on, let me just do a quick sound check as well, make sure everything is, going. yeah, we're going good, we're going good. Okay, so the first formula you got to know is slope of a line, right? And this is when you're given two coordinates. It's the difference of the y values over the difference of the x values that gives you the slope if you're given two coordinates. So in this case, we're going to be subtracting 2 minus 1. You see, it's almost like you stack the coordinates and subtract down over 7 minus 5. Sometimes students say, well, what if I do it the other way? Does it matter? No, that's the beauty of it. If you did one minus two over five minus seven, you get the same response. You get the same answer. So we just need to stay consistent in our ordering. So of course, this would give us a slope of one over two. Boom, done. Okay. So intercept form very essential. This is the ideal format for a line. Ideal usually in terms of telling you what the y-intercept and the slope are, just from looking right out off the bat. So the slope is that m value. Um, the B is your Y intercept where it hits the Y axis. And this is an example, Y equals two X plus seven. So you can see here in the graph, we got that nice Y intercept at seven, that red number. And then the slope is two, AKA up to over one, boom, done. All right, point slope form. This is also an important uh, formula for a line. We've got Y minus Y one equals M times X minus X one. So again, M is your slope once, once again. And X1 and Y1 is any coordinate on the line. That's the beauty of it. You can take any coordinate on the line and plug it in as follows, and you'll get a valid equation for the line. So here we have Y minus 4 equals 3 over 2 times X minus 3. There's that point right there on the line. And once again, the slope is up 3 
over 2. That's it. Midpoint formula. This is how you find the midpoint of two coordinates, okay? And all you're really doing is you're taking the average of the x values and the average of the y values, which kind of makes sense. That's the middle, the average. So let's say we have an example here of 8, 4, and 6, 7. So you're going to take the average of 8 and 6, the average of 4 and 7. By the way, this is going to give you a y-intercept of 7, 5.5. That's right in the middle of those two points. Okay. Now we have the distance formula. The distance formula is the difference of the x value squared plus the difference of the y value squared. And then you take the square root of that. And this is to find the distance between any two points. I feel like it's not so as commonly used on the the SAT explicitly of like finding the difference between two points but I still like to throw it on here uh, just so you guys have some context in case you need to find the radius or something right of a circle and they give you the endpoint uh, like two endpoints of the diameter let's say so you'd have to, to find the radius you'd have to find the distance between those two points divided by two that can come up hold on I'm just turning on my heater here so we have this example of 5, 3, and 1, 0, the distance between the two. We'd see we take the difference there of the x's and the difference of the y's, square them. <coughs> Excuse me. So that becomes 4 squared plus 3 squared, 16 plus 9, that's 25 squared to 25 is, of course, 5. That's it. Next, we have length of an arc of a circle, and we've got it is the central angle divided by 360 degrees, Okay, times 2 pi times the radius. So, for example, with this circle here, that's the central angle N. It's what cuts out that arc. And then the radius, as we know, is the distance from the center to the edge. Area of a sector is quite similar. Oh, by the way, real quick, notice, where's, what's 2 pi R? It's the circumference. So, and, and why am I not including that formula here, by the way? is because you have a formula sheet, right? circumference a lot of the form there's other formulas that you need to know but you don't need to memorize them because they're on the formula sheet given at the start of, of both the sections so anyways we've got it's circum it's a fraction of the circumference likewise area of a sector it's the fraction of the area of a circle pi r squared and it's that same fraction so in a way the formulas are almost identical we're just taking fractions of different things so once again, central angle, and you see the sector, it's that entire slice of pizza, not just the crust, like the length of an arc. <clears throat> quadratic formula, famous formula, right? This helps you find the zeros of a quadratic. So negative B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. And this is when you have a quadratic in standard form. So you plop those in, right? It's just the coefficients of the first two terms plus that last constant thrown in there gives you the zeros. Boom, done. So Katoa, little trigonometry. So for the trig on the SAT, it's not so complicated where you need to know identities and all this stuff, but the you do need to know this acronym. So SOKATOA is sine equals opposite over hypotenuse, cosine equals adjacent over hypotenuse. By the way, this is all relative to angle A. If we did a different angle, then what is adjacent and what is opposite changes, of course. Hypotenuse doesn't change. Hypotenuse is opposite 90 degrees, always. And then we got tangent is opposite over adjacent. So Arshil said, who's safe, a brain cell be Russian. I don't know what that means, but that sounds funny. Okay, so then we got probability. Okay, very straightforward here. It's the number of favorable outcomes over the total number of outcomes. As an example, if I'm rolling a dice and I need a two to win, right? I got one chance of getting a two, that's one, over six different possible numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six. One out of six is my chances of winning. Boom, done. Circle equation, very important, will almost certainly be tested on this test, right? <clears throat> and this is the formula where h comma k is the center. Now notice I have minus h and minus k, but it's the positive h and positive k that gives you the center of the circle. And again, the radius is on the other side, but that's radius squared. So the square root of that number is gonna give you your radius, okay? So as an example here, here's our equation. So our center would be positive two, but negative five, the reverse. And our radius would be six, square root of 36. Here we go, exponential growth, okay? This is your general format. You gotta know this as well, it's always tested, always. 
and that is your initial value, and this is your growth rate, but in it's as a percentage placed in decimal format. So for example, uh, oh, and T is time as well. So for example, if we have exponential growth, you have an initial value of 200 growing at 13% per year. This is how you plug and chug once you, oh yeah, the time is three years. This is how you plug and chug. 200 goes in the front. That 0.13 is being added to one to the third power. If it's exponential decay, meaning it's decreasing by a certain percent every year, right? Now we've got an initial value of 150, decay rate decreasing at 9%, and it's two years. So now we're subtracting that 0 0.09 from one. Everything else is the same. Vertex of a parabola, but this is when it's in standard form. This is a fantastic equation. Got to know it. It's negative B over 2A. That gives you the X value, the vertex. To get the corresponding Y value, you plug that into the equation and you get it. Also, we need to know what vertex form is, okay? Vertex form of a standard quadratic is like this. It's A times, so that A value is the same, times X minus H squared plus K, all right? And the thing is, is the, it, when it's in this format, it's amazing because you know your vertex right off the bat. It's H comma K. So no guesswork, you're good to go. And once again, you flip the, the sign of the H. K you do not. K stays the same. And that's it. The Pythagorean theorem. Now, this one is actually on the formula sheet. So this is one where I gave it, but it's actually given to you. But I gave it because it's so important. It's such a great formula. So it's A squared plus B squared equals C squared, where A and B are the legs, okay? It doesn't matter which is which, but they're the legs. That's what's important. And then your C squared, C is always the hypotenuse. And that's it. Oh, by the way, one other thing I'll say. You're going to use this when you're given two sides of a right triangle, and you need to find the third. That's it, all right? <clears throat> all right, distance equals rate times time. Some people are like, this formula is so simple. Why are you including it? Because it really helps when you're talking about rate, uh, rate problems, distance and time problems. Just putting it in this framework can be a huge help, okay? So that's distance equals rate times time. I got songs for a lot of these formulas, by the way. So if you need help memorizing them, you should check out our song playlist. It's on the main page. Uh, it's quite helpful. All right, here we go. Sine and cosine. So we already talked about Sokotoa. This is a interesting thing that's all, not all, always, but almost always tested on the SAT, is the fact that sine of an angle equals cosine of the complement of that angle. So for example, sine of 10 degrees equals cosine of 80. It also means in a right triangle, sine of one of the acute angles is equal to cosine of the other acute angle, right? Because in a right triangle, there's always two acute angles, yeah? And so sine of one equals cosine of the other and vice versa. And then I kind of just gave a bunch of examples of complements. Complements, once again, means two angles add up to 90 degrees. Supplements mean they add up to 180. Now we get to sum of solutions. We've got ax squared plus bx plus c. A lot of times in the SAT, they'll say, not what are the solutions, but what are the sum of the solutions of this quadratic? And there's a nifty little formula, which is negative b over a. Not negative b over 2a, which gives you the vertex. Negative b over a gives you the sum of the solutions. Now, do we need this? No, you can just find the solutions and add them together. But it, it does save you quite a bit of time if, if you do get a question like this. So for example, in this equation, the sum of the solutions would be negative seven over two. Boom, done. All right, here we go. Uh, the discriminant, huge, huge formula. Almost always tested. I would say always tested. And it comes up when they're like, hey, what's the nature of the solutions? Or they'll say, hey, for, in order for this to have no real solutions, what does this constant have to be? So they say no real solutions, what are they talking about? They're talking about when this value, b squared minus 4ac, is less than zero. So you can use that to set up an inequality. So when it's less than zero, okay, that's when you have no real solution. When they say, hey, it's only got one real solution, that's when it's equal to zero, okay? And last but not least, when it's greater than zero, then we got the two real solutions. And if we're talking about a quadratic where it's just y equals blah, 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 not zero equals, what are they talking about for these solutions? They're talking about x-intercepts. So just to make sure that's clear. Next, we've got area of an equilateral triangle, not 
as important as some of these other ones. I threw it on here because it occasionally comes up. Uh, if you do have the capacity to memorize this formula, it's not so bad. Uh, it's just side length squared times the square root of 3 over 4. You can also find the area of an equilateral triangle by dropping an altitude, turning it into two 30, 60, 90 right triangles, which are on the formula sheet, by the way. And then you can uh, basically calculate the area of each, double it up, boom, done. But this is a nice little shortcut. So for example, side length of 1, 1 squared. You see what I'm saying? Side length of 2. So just a couple different examples. 2 squared is 4. Side length of 3 will be 9 rad 3 over 4. Boom, done. Pythagorean triples. Now, do you need these? No, because you can always use Pythagorean's theorem. But are they amazingly helpful? Yes. They are, again, a time saver and a nice little trick to know. So the typical ones that are tested are 3, 4, 5s, 5, 12, 13s, 7, 24, 25 is not as much, um, and 8, 15, 17. So I say the first, second, and fourth are the most common. And it's nice because if you're finding a missing side of the triangle, you rep recognize it's a triple. You don't have to you do the Pythagorean's theorem. So you save 20, 30 seconds, something like that, especially if it's no calculator, right? But they also will test the multiples. So a 3, 4, 5, it can also be a 6, 8, 10, a 9, 12, 15. That comes up a lot, 12, 16, 20, et cetera. Uh, and then we got multiples of all the remaining ones. So just get your head around this to the best of your ability. If you have to memorize one, 3, 4, 5 is the winner. Perpendicular slope, what is that? Well, if a, if a line has a slope of A over B, and they say, what's the perpendicular slope or a line that's perpendicular to this? Comes up all the time. Perpendicular is the opposite reciprocal, meaning it would be negative B over A. So if you have a slope of two-thirds, what's perpendicular to that? And again, the y-intercept here is irrelevant. Negative 3 over 2. Just, as a ca uh, just FYI, if we wanted a parallel line, the slopes are the same. If it's A over B, it's also A over B. But for the lines to be parallel, the slopes have to be the same and the y-intercepts have to be different. If both the slopes and the y-intercepts are the same, it's the same line. They're right on top of each other. That's an infinite solution situation, just FYI. All right, sum of angles in a polygon, any polygon. <clears throat> Excuse me, let me get some water. <clears throat> and represents the... <clears throat> excuse me, n represents the number of sides of the polygon, and then you just plug and chug, right? So if you have a triangle, it's 3 minus 2 times 180, 180. We all should know that. Triangle, angle, sum theorem, all the angles in a triangle add up to 180. If we have a rectangle or a quadrilateral, that gives us 360, and a pentagon is 540. <clears throat> okay, my voice is going a little downhill. By the way, if you guys like what you see so far, please click that like button. It helps us tremendously. Um, go ahead and Add a comment if you're watching this after the live. But, uh, all right. Hey, thank you, young Skywalker. Appreciate that. Here we go. <clears throat> 41 strategies to get a perfect 800 in SAT math. All right. Now we're getting to our most popular series. So we're going to talk through all 41. Let's hope the voice holds up. Here we go. Boom. Tip number one. Ratios, rates, and proportions, one of the most commonly tested topics on the SAT. That's what the percentages are there, 6.21% of the questions. That's for me averaging a bunch of tests. Uh, obviously, it's not always going to be like this, but this is my estimation. And it's labeling your proportions, okay? So if we are to create a proportion, th this is something like it's 7 to 400 equals something to 20,000, right? If you're setting up a proportion... You want to make sure to label it correctly. Be like, you know, um, what is it? Selected over total. Selected over total. That way, you're not going to have a mistake when you're setting up a proportion. So those labels are really, really helpful to make sure your proportions are good. Okay, next. Use conversion factors. Okay, this is for the units category. Again, a big, a big category. So if we're talking about something like this, where we're converting, you know, 580,000, what is it, 580,000 miles per year, uh, you know, that's what it is, right? We're trying to go from, to, from miles per year to miles per hour. So you want to kind of step through this carefully, use conversion factors, be like, okay, well, one year is equal to 365 days. 365 days is 
or sorry, one day is equal to 24 hours, like that step by step. And that way you can make sure you're doing the correct multiplication division, whatever you need to do. Um, D Ashraf is asking about calculators. I have a video that talks about, it's called everything you need to know about the SAT. Uh, you can check it, Google it on search for it on YouTube, but that one explains all the calculators that you can bring. It's also on the college board website. <clears throat> Tip number three, use your percent equation. Something like this. This is a very abstract question. What is our percent equation? Percent in decimal format times the total equals the part. So if you set up a question like this using that nice percent equation, this question becomes much easier. Okay. You know what? I'm going to actually do this so I can uh, write here. Let's see if I can. I got to get this going here. Web paint. This way I can explain these a little bit more here. It's going to make me refresh, I think. Let's see. Okay. There we go. So in this case, right? Oh. <clears throat> My percent equation is like I said, you know, wait, let's let's see this. It's like percent in decimal format times the total equals the part. That's ah, pretty useful, right? Uh let's let's play this one out. So she bought a computer store. They gave a 20% discount off the original price. So if you get a 20% discount, you are only paying 80%. So if we have our original price as X, that's your 20% discount. Then you're paying on this. Actually, wait, let's move those parentheses. Then on this, you're adding on 1.08 or 8% sales tax. And this equals what you paid to the cashier. So it's like using this nice percent equation. Now they're like, hey, what is what is the price of the original, which is X in terms of P? Now you do, do is just divide by that. 1.08 times 0.8. Now you might be tempted to be like, all right, let me multiply this out, simplify it, but they didn't do that here. You quickly recognize that once you look at the answer choices. So that's that. All right, let's move on. Oops. <clears throat> All right, this is really helpful. So when I say translate into an equation as you read, I'd be like 16 plus 4x is 10 more than 14. I always do it in all my videos. You've probably seen me do it if you watch the channel a lot. Huge help. All right, next, tip number five. All right, know the slope and y-intercept. So what is my slope? K, right? Slope intercept form. What is my Y intercept? Four. All right. So why is this so important? Well, look, it's saying the line contains the point C, D. What is the slope in terms of line C and D? So again, I know I'm solving for K. So what I do here is I'd plug in chug like this, plug in D for the Y value, C for the X value. And then they said, what's the slope? I just isolate K. I'm minus four. And then I divide by C and boom. There's my answer. Okay. Yeah, guys, if you're sharing numbers, I, uh, I don't want you guys to share personal information on the chat. So you can maybe contact each other some other way, jump on our Discord server and do that, but um, not here. You, you don't want to do that anyways. You don't want to put your personal information out like that to, to everybody. So, you know, for your own safety. All right. Interpreting linear functions plug and chug. I say this all the time, right? This is a really difficult question. Um, they're talking about changes here, right? And which one of these equates to, hey, you know, one degree Fahrenheit is equivalent to five nine Celsius. The way I love to break this one down is I'm like, all right, well, let's take a value of Fahrenheit. They're saying one degree Fahrenheit increase equates to what Celsius? Whoops. So let's say, well, I'm going to go from 32 to 33, excuse me, at 32 degrees, plug it in, that's zero degrees Celsius. At 33, you plug it in, 33 minus 32 is one times five ninths is five ninths. Well, look at that. That is a five ninths increase. It takes the guesswork out of these difficult interpretation problems. So you know like one is true and you can kind of go through and do the same thing for the remainder of the choices. Plug and chug. <clears throat> 
Okay, for these ones, isolate, isolate, isolate. What is the value of W? Well, we're gonna get W all by itself. So check it out. I'm gonna multiply by 5 thirds to get rid of that. And we got 20 over nine. No question, no guesswork, done. <clears throat> Here we go. Start with the simplest relationship. So in something like this, they're giving you these inequalities. <clears throat> they're giving you these inequalities. Gosh, sorry. I've been trying to rest my voice and get it back. It's almost there, hopefully. Right, we got two things that are happening. But the easier one is they're saying they can carry only up to 45 boxes. That's the number of boxes. That's the number of boxes. Only up to 45. If you work on this relationship first, these two are already out, right? X plus Y shouldn't be less than that. So I've already got it limited down to two. Then you can put together the other one, which might be a little bit more complicated, but that's your starting point. So choose one, get it down to a 50-50 shot, and then go for it. Elimination over substitution. I know there's some diehard substitution people that love to solve by substitution. I can say like almost invariably I'm using elimination. There's exceptions to that, but almost invariably. So that's what I would say. I love substitution. I mean, so I love elimination. It's easy. Uh, I'll show you how to do it real quick. So I just double this one up on top and I get negative 6x plus 8y equals 40 plus 6y equals 15. And then look, you just add the equations. Goodbye. 14y equals 55. Wait, did I do that right? 40, double, double, eight. Oh, shoot. I wrote this wrong. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold on. Let's back up. I want to give you guys the right, the right thing here. That was supposed to be 3y equals 15. Add them up. Goodbye. We get 11y equals 55. Y equals 5. And then solve for x. Plug it back in, negative 3x, 4 times 5 is 20, equals 20, x is 0. And then you want to double check here, plug in 0, 3 times 5 is 15, boom, done. <clears throat> okay, for linear inequality word problems, another category. By the way, these are the 41 categories identified by Khan Academy, which is in partnership with the College Board. And... We want to think in slope intercept form. We're setting this up, right? So there's my 60 per hour. That's my slope. That's my rate, okay? And she also has to pay $10 for a course right off the bat. That's my y-intercept. And she wants to spend no more than 280. Now we've immediately structured this equation. And this is key because once you're in this position, you know what to do. You know you got to isolate. That's it. So think in terms of slope-intercept form for these types of questions. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, here. Identifying relevant numbers for these system of linear equation word problems. So, like, you know, 1497. I underlined every number right off the bat. And, but they end up not being relevant, right? The relevant numbers are 43 longer than the first one. Or sorry, uh, this would be the first voyage. They're saying the first is 43 longer than the second voyage. And then now you know what you need, right? You got this and these two together are going to equal 1,003. Again, it's all about that setup and that identification, and then you're good to go. Okay. Vertex form, we already covered it. It's so key. Why is it so key? Because look. I know what the vertex is. so And these are all in vertex form. <clears throat> so I know that this function, at a minimum, has to be x minus the x value of the vertex plus the y value of the vertex. And that eliminates these two right off the bat. Now it's just a matter of like, hey, is it 4 or is it 1? You can check with one of these points, right? If I plug in 4 and 5 for x and y, 5 equals... And then 4 minus 3 is 1a plus 1. Subtract, subtract. And you see a is 4. a is the winner. Boom, done. Okay. 
analyze the entire graph before reviewing choices. I always do this. I don't rush to here and then go back. I want to understand what's going on in the graph first. Oh, look at this. It's miles per hour versus time. So look and the running speed, right? We, this is a running speed. So it looks like, oh, she's going faster, 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 faster. She runs at a constant speed. She kind of slows down a little bit. Then she accelerates at her fastest time here at 25, uh, to 25 minutes. She's running eight miles per hour and then gradually slowing down until she stops. Takes five seconds, maybe 10. Got my head around it. Now I'm ready to attack these problems, okay? Invest that time. And tip number 14. Here we go. A lot of these to get through. Uh, no slope versus y-intercept. Slope next to the variable. Y-intercept, 32.01. What is slope? It's the rate of change. This is my starting value when L is zero. And they said, what is the meaning of 1.88? It's the slope. It's the rate of change. So we already know that 1.88 is going to be the rate of change. So it's got to be like one of two. One of two. Um, and it's the approximate increase in the height for every one inch of the femur. But if you're not sure, again, go back to that plug and chug method, right? When L is zero, you got 32.01 .1, for the height. When L is one, the height goes up to 33.89. So the height goes up by 1.88 as the femur length, which is L, goes up by one. Boom, done. Um, we're gonna talk about standard deviation, I think. Well, here's the thing with standard deviation. It's quite simple on the SAT, as long as you know the definition. It's, you don't have to calculate it. You just have to know what it means. And what it means is this. It is the spread of the data. The bigger the spread, the bigger the standard deviation. The more tightly packed it is, together it is, the smaller it is. That's all you need to know when comparing standard deviations. <clears throat> okay. When you're talking about uh, quadratic and exponential expressions in this topic, recognize vertex form, vertex from intercept form. What is this? Intercept form, right? Because this is showing me I have an x-intercept of negative six and positive four. Now, if we're talking about a minimum value of f, that is the vertex, either the max or the min, right? So I already know these two are out. It's got to be one of these guys. Um, and then the question is, you know, which one is correct, et cetera. I know that my vertex is happening in the exact middle of my x-intercepts. What's in the middle of negative 6 and 4? Negative 1. So going to intercept form and be x minus negative 1, a.k.a. x plus 1, this is the winner, done. Because my vertex is at negative one, comma 25. But that's it. Back up here, get more comfortable. All right. Next, uh, we got this one, structure and expressions, another subcategory. So which of the following is equivalent to the expression above? Excuse me. So, uh, Wait one second. Eliminate options using positive. Oh, yeah, yeah. So one thing we can do is if we're talking about positives and negatives, what like what is this really doing? They they basically completed the square. But do we have to do that? Not necessarily. OK, you know, we, we can complete the square. It's a little bit of a complicated operation. I can show you how to do that as well. But if we do, again, a little plug and chug, we can kind of knock this out and figure out which one's equivalent. For example, if I plug in 2 for x, I get 4 plus 12 plus 4, which is 20. And then I run down the lines. Which ones do I get 20? Here I plug in 2, I get 25 plus 5 is 30 out. Here I plug in 2, I get 25 minus 5 is 20. So that's still in the running. This is 1 plus 5 is 6 out. Actually... That one plug-in, by the way, just eliminated it and got me down to B. Um, but if I needed to, then I can go on the flip side, try a negative number and check it out, right? Like if I plugged in negative 2, that'd be 1 minus 5 is negative 4. Negative 2, 4 minus 12 plus 4 um, is also negative 4. So double verification. Okay. <clears throat> operations with polynomials binomials must be foiled i always say foil 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 if it's factored and factor 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 if it's foiled one or the other and 
So again, foiling just means you have to remember to write it like this. Boom, a squared. Boom, boom. That's AB over 2 plus AB over 2, which is just AB. And then plus B squared over 4. And we're good to go. <clears throat> 18, center spread and shape of distribution. So we want to know the formula to calculate mean. What is that? It's the sum of all the values divided by the number of values that there are equals the mean. Very important. Okay. You know that, you're good to go. And you can set this up as follows, right? Eight players score 14.5. Um, sorry, the mean is 14.5 times eight. That gives me the total, right? Over the, uh, wait. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. <clears throat> then you remove the highest score, and that mean is now 12. It's a beautiful equation. So you're trying to think, like, what's the value? Now you got an equation. What do you have to do? Solve for x. That's it. Boom, done. And Chris says you can use the calculator for that. For the, That's true, but um, if it's on the no calculator section, you're going to, this is a calculator problem, by the way, but no calculator, you're going to need to know that. <clears throat> okay. Memorize the formula for exponential growth and decay. We already talked about that, right? It's y equals initial value 1 plus or minus r to the t power. So we went over that. Memorize it. You can apply it here to a problem like this, and you're golden. So we're going to move on from that. Linear and quadratic systems. Just substitute and factor. Okay, so we're trying to get, um, if the function g not shown is defined by negative x plus 10, what is one possible value of a such that these two are equal to each other? Um, so what am I trying to do? I'm trying to set these guys equal to each other, right? Um, so negative x plus 10 equals negative 1 half times x minus 4 squared. Once we got that, FOIL, distribute, simplify, and boom, done. Now, if it is a calculator section, you can graph this line and see where it intersects, right? <clears throat> so this is a y-intercept of 10, and it's a negative 1 slope. It's kind of not really... So it goes from 10 down to 10 like this, and then you can see the two points where it intersects. It intersects at 2, and it intersects at 8. And that's it. <coughs> Sorry. Function notation, replace and simplify. They're saying, what is f of negative 3x? Well, just take that and plop it in for x here. Negative 2 times negative 3x plus 5. Distribute or multiply. 6x plus 5. B is the winner. Done. Okay, this is so important, filling in missing dimensions. So they're giving you a value. Like every time on a diagram, you should do this, okay? Every time. This is 75. They said 180 minus Z is 2Y. Well, 2Y we already know is 150, which means that if you subtract and then divide by negative 1, Z is 30. So look at that. So much easier now. This is isosceles. We know that these two angles must be 75 and 75. This is supplementary. It has to add up to 180 because it's on the line, linear pair, to that. So angle x is 105. Boom, done. Pretty difficult considering it's like 18 on the no calculator section. It's meant to be pretty difficult. We just did that in, what, like 20 seconds? So writing it in makes a huge difference. Um, yes, you're right, Amar. Not, not for the digital version. No longer a no calculator. That is correct. Okay, and this one, ah, skip the nonsense. We're talking about isolating quantities where they're just like, hey, what is W in terms of A? Goodbye. Okay, and then you just go to current formula and you just isolate W. Multiply by 30. And then minus 4. 30A minus 4, boom, done. <laughs> I love that one. All right. 
Oh, um, one thing. You know it's an isolating quantities question when they're all like this. W equals W equals blah, blah, blah. So that's the giveaway. <clears throat> all right. Know your universe. So what are they talking here? They're saying if there's a total blah, blah, what is the finding is the closest probability that a right-handed student selected at random is female? So what I mean by that is once you do the calculations and figure this out, we're only looking at this bucket, okay? So it, we assume it's a right-handed female. I'm sorry, we assume it's a right-handed student. What is the probability that they're female? So whatever you calculate there, you throw that on top. Not the entire total, okay? It's very important. Um, okay, moving on. Now, scatter plots. <clears throat> Very important to recognize most of the time <clears throat> when they're asking about a value, they're asking for the value on the line of best fit, not the scatter plot. So, for example, it says, based on the line of best fit, what's close to the predicted leaf mass after three years? Well, I'm sorry. Um, sorry, negative two degrees, excuse me. So, we're going to, ne that's negative 2.5. Here's negative two, like roughly right there. We're not interested in this value up here. That's not on the line. We're interested in this value right on the line of best fit, which is around 70. Okay, so don't get, don't let that trip you up on the test. Um, I'm a science student. Would you recommend me to take ACT once I get an average score on the SAT? I mean, you don't need to take both. If you get a good score on the SAT, you're good. Um, if you think you can do better on the ACT because of the science section, then, then take it, practice and see, and then compare the scores. As long as you're doing good on one, there's no reason to do double prep. <clears throat> the population of mosquitoes in a swamp is estimated over the course of 20 weeks, which of the following best describes the relationship between time and the estimated population. Oh, wait. Sorry. Distinguish between adding and multiplying. Sorry. That's the tip. So when we're talking about is this exponential versus linear, if you're adding by a constant every time, let's say we're adding by 900 every time, okay, that'd be linear. But it's not. It's multiplying by 10 every time. And when that's the case, it's growth. They love these questions, by the way. <clears throat> 27. When solving, get the same base. Okay, so right off the bat for a question like this, I'm not even thinking. I'm just being like, well, 8 is 2 to the third power, right? And then I'm like, cool, that's 2 to the 3x over 2 to the y. Then we can simplify once we have the same base. That's just 2 to the 3x minus y. And look at that. It's right there. So you know it's 2 to the 12th. A is the winner. Boom, done. <clears throat> the function above models the height. So here, understand vertex y. Oh, understand vertex y intercept and x intercepts. <coughs> so in standard form, 72, that value, is your y-intercept. Because if you plug in 0 for t, that's what you get, which means it's the initial value. That's it. Okay, vertex in a quadratic is your high point or your low point. And the x-intercepts are where you hit the ground. That's it. Okay, no polynomial long division. You can get around it. You can plug in value of x and figure out which one's equivalent. But I, I think, it's, think it's nice to learn. So if you want to do it, here's how you do it. You divide, you divide. x goes into x squared. We don't care about anything else. x times. x times that is x squared minus 3x. Then we subtract, subtract, cancel. Negative 2x plus 3x is x minus 5. That goes in one time. x minus 3 subtract, subtract, that gives us a remainder of negative two, and we throw that on top of the divisor, and there's your answer. Now, if you didn't know the long division, like I said, you can choose a value for x. Don't usually just stay away from um, one and zero, because you'll get a couple, you'll get like false positives, but um, if you can do two and run it through, you'll see probably this is the only, maybe one other one might hit, but then you have to try three and then you'll get your definitive answer. But anyways, that's your workaround. 
Okay, sampling must be random. So they said, which of the following must be true for this type of thing here? And the key is, hold on, let's see. Let me remember this one. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, she surveyed people at a playground. Is that a random sample? No, because obviously this is a biased result. Only people that go to a playground have kids, right? <laughs> like usually, uh, unless there's something wrong with you. So if if you're going to if you're going to a playground, do the sample. It's not a random sample. It's flawed right off the bat. So, boom, done. Thirty one. Uh, know where to find the formula. So I talked about the formula sheet. So this is on the front of the calculator, no calculator section if you're taking it domestically. Um, and look, I'm talking about a cylinder. Flip back to the front, and there's my cylinder. Sphere, cone, pyramid, um, rectangular prism, special right triangles, Pythagorean's theorem, as I mentioned before. <clears throat> so know what's on here, and know what you don't have to memorize, and know where it is, okay? Um, we already talked about this in the formula review, so I don't have to go too much into this, but if they're saying sine of X is this cosine of the complement is literally the same thing and you're done in under five seconds. Okay. Okay. Most circle problems are triangle problems in disguise. Look at this. I'm drawing a triangle and more importantly, I'm drawing a triangle using the radius. Okay. So. They said, what is the value of K? First of all, I know that H is right in the middle of these two guys. 4 and 20 um, midpoint formula, right? Average of 4 and 20 is 12. So I know it's 12, and this point is 12 comma 0. And now I can figure out what that K value is. How? Well, we got nice little right triangles here, okay? This is a distance of 8. This radius is 10. Well, look at this. I got a right triangle. You, you can use Pythagorean's theorem or recognize that it's a Pythagorean triple. And it's at 6, 8, 10. That 3, 4, 5 I told you pops up all the time. So we're going up by 6. That means that K is 6. Boom, done. Next, know your conjugates. For these problems, all they're trying to get you to do is get rid of that I in the denominator. Conjugate is the same thing as that where you just flip the sign. You multiply out by this and you're going to get one of these, whatever it is, right? Um, or sorry, not one of these because they just want the value of A. Actually, maybe I'll do it. So on the bottom, you get 9 plus 6I minus 6I. The I's cancel out. Minus 4I squared. I squared is negative 1, so it's plus 4. And then over 24. 16i, negative 3i is 13i, and then minus 2i squared, which is plus 2. Boom. That's 26 plus 13i over 13. Divide both by 13, we get 2 plus i, where a is the, non, is the real part, a is the winner, done. <clears throat> For these ones, just remember this. Numerator is the power. <clears throat> the denominator is the radical, okay? And that will get you through a lot of these rational exponent problems, just knowing that. Now, unfortunately, this is not shown here. So how would we take this one to the next level? I do see that 9 is actually 3 squared. So remember that base is like this, okay? And the reason why I'm going this route is because I see 3 here and 3 here. And I see in my answer with a 9, it's neither of these. So I already know these are out. So then I'm saying, well, that's the fourth root of 3 to the 6th power. Well, what is the fourth root of 3 to the 6th power? Again, 3 to the 6th is 3 to the 4th times 3 squared. So this can come out as a 3, and I'm left with 3 squared inside. Still don't see it, right? But 3 squared to the 4th uh, root is, again, to the 2nd over 4, power over root. And that's 3 to the 1 half, right? We can simplify it just like a fraction. And the 1 half is just a regular square root. D is the winner. Done.
Okay, know how to identify roots. Well, they're saying which of the following could be this equation. Well, what are my roots? That's the important part because this is in factored form. I got a root at negative 3, a double root at 0 because it's bouncing, not penetrating, and then a single root at 2. So what does that mean? I should get an x plus 3 because a negative 3 would zero that out, an x minus 2, and then I also need just an x where plug it in 0 will zero it out. But the bounce means that it's an even degree, either 2, 4, 6, 8, probably just 2 though. And like that, I pieced it together. And we know the order's out of order, but it doesn't matter. B is the winner. Done. Yo, what's up from Nigeria? Amazing. Seven Maduka. Awesome. Welcome to the stream. All right. Oh, for tip uh, number 33, how's the radius 10? They gave it to us in the problem. So when you rewatch the stream, you'll see that was that was a given. Know the constants of quadratics. Okay, so here, what are all these, right? There's, and by the way, in this case, they're giving us this. Well, since it's going upwards, that means A is positive. Since we've got a positive y-intercept, C is positive. So that's important because in this format, they're negating it. Immediately, my thing is going down, but C is still positive. That's the um, C value, uh, that's the y value of the vertex. Uh, I don't know what B is, but I know it's going to be above the x-axis. Let's pretend it's there. I don't know. B is zero. It's there. But this tells me right off the bat that it opens downwards. Um, and then the vertex is B comma C because, it, like I said, in vertex form, as we've gone over, it's the opposite of that and then that. So that's how you do it. All right, 38, know the formulas for... Okay, so we talked about these formulas in the formulas video, so you already know you got to know this. So how do we do it here? We got a circle. We got A, O, B with a central measure of 5 pi fourths. That's in radians. And the area of the sector is what fraction of the circle? Well, what is my area of the sector? Again, it's 5 pi fourths divided by... Now, if it was degrees, we divide by 360. But what's equivalent to degrees in radians? 2 pi. Okay. Times the area. But they said what fraction of the area of the circle? I already told you area of sector is a fraction of the area of the circle. So I don't even care about all this. And they didn't even give me a radius. So we can't do that. But this is my fraction. Okay. And to simplify that fraction, because we can't enter pi, obviously. 5 pi fourths times the reciprocal of, of 2 pi, which is 1 over 2 pi. Cancel the pi's out, which is what we want. 5 over 8, boom, done. 39. And by the way, if you ever want to convert, you know, radians to degrees, just multiply by 180 over pi. Cancel, cancel. That's 900 over 4, which is 452.25. So it's 225 degrees. So you could have done the same thing. It's just 225 over 360. It still would have given you 5 eighths. Okay, which of the, oh, know the formula of the circle on the coordinate plane. So we already went over that in the formula video, but, or the formula portion, but the center is, again, the opposite, negative 3, comma 1, and that means the radius is 5, right? So from this, you can sort of piece together, let's see if I can draw this out reasonably, you can kind of piece together which one is outside, I believe it's D from my recollection, so here's you know, this point is going to be 0, 1. That's like the farthest to the right. Oh, no, sorry. What am I saying? This is a radius of 5. So this would be 5 over. So this point would be 2, comma 1. And this is going out 1 more and up 1. So you can clearly see 3, 2 is outside. So you got to know the formula of a circle in order to piece that together. Tip number 40. We're almost there. Pay attention to the sample for data inferences, okay? Which of the following is best supported by the sample data? What is the sample? A random sample of fish were caught, and the sample contained 150 largemouth bass, 30% weighed more than 2 pounds. Okay. <clears throat> um, and I guess the sample is only largemouth bass, it looks like, right? So let's look at this. The majority of all fish in the pond weigh less than 2 pounds. 
Um, yeah, so this is, oh, wait, wait, wait. Sorry. The sample contained 150, but they're not talking about, they're only talking about, so excuse me, the sample's more than largemouth bass, but they're only talking about the largemouth bass in this context. So we can't apply this 30% to all the fish. So these two are immediately out. Um, yeah, those, all three actually are immediately out because we're talking about all fish. But then they said 30% of the largemouth bass in the pond weigh more than two pounds. That's basically what it said. So that's the baseline. That's why D is the winner. Okay, last one. Here we go. Memorize Sokotoa. We talked about that. In the figure above, they said, what is the value of cosine of E? By the way, similar triangles. If E corresponds to B, all I got to do is take cosine of B. It's the same as cosine of E. Cosine is adjacent to B over hypotenuse. 12 over 13 is the winner. And that's how you do it. Okay. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to do a little Q&A now. And I, I can't stay too long because my voice is struggling. I actually have a call in a, in a, in a few minutes. So I'm going to try and answer a couple questions, and then I got to dip. But I want you guys to know, thank you so much for coming. Just the fact that you're here means that you care. Caring in life is one of the most important things to achieving anything. Uh, trying your best, working hard. And I know it sounds cliche, but it is so true. Um, it's so true, especially if you're trying to build a business and do your thing. Um, okay, so let's see here. Um, hey, you're very welcome. You're very welcome, SF Riff. Uh, let's see if we got a couple questions here that I missed. Any guides questions? No, there's no English live, unfortunately. I'm not the English expert. I'm taking the SAT tomorrow. I'll take the full section, but I don't consider myself an expert in the English. I defer to my tutors on that front um one in particular who's amazing but she's not doing a stream today unfortunately you're very welcome uh maria okay when you split a triangle and have to solve for the height would you do would you do one half bh for the base you split in half for the full base good question yeah if you're doing it for the you're doing one half of the full base okay um i know what i know what you're talking about you're talking about like this you're saying like an equilateral triangle, you drop it, right? You get the height. This is what you'd use for the base to get the full area of the triangle. So one half base, and this would be the height times height. <clears throat> to avoid careless mistakes, it's... Okay, I'll give you a couple right off the bat. I got a whole tip series on this, but you know, underline all the numbers, every number that you read in the question, number one. Number two, um, for the free response make sure to triple check any numbers, especially if you're inputting them into a calculator. Um, oh wait, uh, the number three, underline the very last part, the crux of the question, because sometimes they'll give you an equation, they'll say, what's the value of three X, not X, so you gotta underline that. Um, for the quadratic problem, B represented the vertex, at, yeah, so quadratic is negative B over two A, that's the X value of the vertex, and then the Y value, you plug this in to the quadratic. Um, okay, guys. Tips on focusing. It's different for everybody. But the most important thing is get a good night's sleep. Eat healthy in the morning. Drink lots of water. That's probably the most critical thing um, for short-term fixes. Um, and that's it. <sighs> okay, guys. I got to bounce. My voice is really tired. I got to let it rest. Thank you guys so much for joining. You guys are amazing. I wish you guys all the best of luck. Join our Discord server if you're still looking for last-minute tips or you want to talk to other students. I highly recommend it. It's free, like I said. We got an amazing community there. Description is in the link below. Give this video a like, please, if you did benefit from it, if you liked it. Thank you guys so much for joining, and I will see you in the next video. I'm taking the test, too, tomorrow, so we'll talk about that next week, and I wish you the best of luck.